Well, hello again, ladies and gentlemen. Welcome to part three of our lecture, uh, Criminology, Chapter 6. This is based upon Frank Smallager's book, Criminology, third edition. And we are doing uh, this chapter six is on social structure theories with a brief overview of sociological theories at the beginning. And then we get into various social structure theories. In the previous video, we talked about social disorganization with a little look also at broken windows and the concept of broken windows policing and what's that all about. Uh, you may have heard recently uh, that we have a candidate for DA in Philadelphia and some of the folks that are promoting him actually believe that broken windows policing is oppressive against minorities because basically the idea of broken windows is going after the little things because the little things tend to lead to the big things. Great example in the city of Philadelphia, and was actually based upon things that were done in New York City as well uh, in the 80s and beyond, is when the transit system, SEPTA, when the transit police officers go after fare evaders. Most law-abiding citizens don't jump the turnstiles and, and try to avoid the fare, so they often, when they go after fare evaders, find people that are wanted for robbery and other various crimes or warrants. They might have guns, they may have drugs, whatever. That is part of broken windows policing. However, because it does mean going after little things, it tends to put the police in contact in a negative way with more people who may believe, well, you know, what I'm doing, you know, there's people out there killing people and all I'm doing is I uh, throw my cigarette on the sidewalk. Why are the cops harassing me? And generally the, the theory is if it's not, you know, a serious thing, maybe they're not going to charge the person if they don't come up with something else. But a lot of people feel that it's, it's harassment, even though it's been found in many communities statistically to be very successful in the reduction of crime. And if you want an answer to that question about whether it really does, go study New York since, since Rudy Giuliani, Giuliani was the mayor uh, on through the present day and see what the results were and the drop in crime and the severe drop in murders in that area. So a little bit of a review. So this time we want to look at strain theory. Okay. Strain theory is a concept in that people tend to react to the environment around them in a certain way, which may lead them to commit crimes. Granted, it's not going to always lead to somebody committing crimes, but the idea of strain theory and then general strain theory is that people react to their environment in a certain way, which then is the focus of, of their behavior. So definition, sociological approach that posits a disjuncture between socially and subculturally sanctioned means and goals as the cause of criminal behavior. So what does that mean? That means that there's a difference between what the goal is in my culture or my society and possibly what I am capable of doing within my environment. So if I live in a very you know, poverty-stricken, rundown area and the goal is that everybody has a nice house, nice car, nice clothes, whatever, that presents a strain because there is a, a disjuncture or difference between the two, and that may be a cause of criminal behavior. A classic statement on strain theory was offered by Robert Merton way back in 1938. He had the concept of anime, basically a social condition in which norms are uncertain or lacking. A strain can be thought of as a pressure individual feel to reach socially determined goals. So again, if you watch TV in your home and you see all the commercials, especially the ones for the nicer cars, the nicer clothes, the nice watch, the nice jewelry, you know, all this stuff that some people are watching these commercials and they can't, they, they'll never afford them in their entire lifetime, let alone this week. And that presents a, a strain because you have that pressure, which is, it's one of the bases. Strain theory could be one of the bases is for uh, uniforms in, in the school setting because there's this strain or this pressure, you know, that everybody's wearing, you know, you got certain people, not everybody, you got certain people wearing, you know, designer clothes, nice clothes, and then you got the kid who can't afford that. And that causes pressure. You got the kid with the nice kicks and nice sneakers to come in with, and the other kid can't afford it. 
you know, there's pressure. So the idea there, the relieving that pressure from a, a policy perspective, one of the ideas to relieve that pressure is to create a uniform within the school. So everybody has to come to the school wearing the same thing, pretty much. So everybody's somewhat equal. So they're all wearing, in a lot of schools, the uniform consists of a polo shirt like this with a school logo on it and maybe some tan slacks or different color slacks. You know, the girls, it might be a skirt. Depends upon the environment. You know, a lot of schools are going gender neutral with just everybody's wearing pants. Uh, I grew up in a Catholic school environment. Catholic schools, the guys always had to wear white shirts and, and a dark colored tie with black slacks. And the girls wore some type of, whether it was a, a, a jumper or a blouse and a skirt. But there was always a standard color. In my elementary school, for the girls, it was always plaid. In my uh, high school, because it was based in our our, uh, our school mascot was a leprechaun. We were the Fighting Irish, so the colors were green and white. So the the girls wear white blouses and and green skirts, and that that tended to make everybody equal. At least that's the thought. That if you have everybody wearing the same thing, you know, we're all the same, and you're not going to have you're not going to have strain or fights or battles over clothes at the very least. All right, this is just a, a graphic example that might show that, you know, you have the people on the right, they're steadily climbing the ladder, they have their success goals, you see the graduate from college, you see that the house, the house, the married, the house and the kid, and they're continuing to climb the ladder. You see the one on the left, you know, some of the rungs on the ladder are crooked, indicating a possibly a, a difficult, a difficult trip up the ladder. And some places you see the rungs are broken. Maybe the person falls down a ladder and they have issues and you see off to the side some of the things that might happen if the person falls off the ladder. Uh, maybe they got an F in the class, which, you know, set them back a little bit. How do they react and what do they do as a result? Are they out as example, you know, using drugs, buying drugs, robbing people? You know, what, what's going to go on? Or they want up homeless? You know, these are the examples. In your book, and it, it's, uh, I, unfortunately the, the chart is not here in the slide deck, but if you look on your book, there is a, uh, a slide. Let me uh, stop to share for a second so I can throw this up on the screen for you. Uh, I should have had it up digitally, but there's this slide, or not slide, there's this chart that's in your textbook. So if you would find that in the chapter and take a look at it with me while I discuss it with you. And what you see is that you have a list of different ways that people will respond to the situation and then it says goals and means. All right, so what this means, look at the first. The first one is conformity. Conformity is basically the person who does what they're supposed to do, the plus the plus means that they accept the goals. They're going after the goals. Maybe they're going for that house with the, you know, the, the nice house, you know, the wife, the nice house, whatever, and maybe the nice car. They're shooting for that. That's that's often the only. Maybe it's maybe it's they want to finish like you do, your associate's or bachelor's degree in criminal justice or whatever field that you might be in, because we do have a few non-criminal justice students in the class. You know, you came into Pierce College and you had a goal, so you accepted that goal, and the person who is a conformist. They also accept the appropriate means to reach that goal. So they know that it takes that hard work and the steps. So whether it's going to college or it's working in the work environment, and most of you in Pierce College are doing both at the same time. Uh, so you're, you're working and you're going to college. Some of you are raising families already. But the goals are out there for you. And this is one of the things that the means to get there is, is going through uh, the appropriate means. The innovation is the next thing. Innovators are those that they accept the goals and they're like, yeah, I want the nice house, the nice car, I want the cash, I want whatever. But you know what? Either there's two ways this could go. It could be like, well, I don't have the ability to get there. Maybe their education is, is not good and they don't see that they could work hard to get there. Or maybe they choose not to. They prefer to take a, a what they think is an easier route, which what we know long-term in the criminal justice system that that easier route sometimes ends in tragedy and sometimes 
is not as easy as you think it is. But they choose that. So the innovators, they're going for the gold or whatever the goal is, but they're not going by the normal appropriate means. The next one is the ritualist. The ritualist is an, is an, interesting, an interesting character because the, the ritualist is one that doesn't really care about the goals and is not really concerned about uh, what they're doing. They, they accept the normal way of doing things. This is the interesting thing. They accept the means. So they know, you know, I got to go to school, I get through high school, and then I get a job, and then I work, and, you know, I just work, and I support my family or whatever. But they're not looking for much beyond that. So that's your ritualist. They're just going through the motions and living, but not, re not really going anywhere. So maybe they're not on a ladder, they're just walking across somewhere, you know, going, basically going nowhere, uh, and they're moving ahead, moving forward. They're not doing that. Retreatists are people who abandon both the goals and the means. So they may be people who sink into drug use or doing other things that, that are an escape. They're not looking at, you know, they don't want to go after the goals and they really don't care about what society is doing and what society expects me to do. So they're just going and doing their own thing, escaping from society. To, not to be confused with the final one, the last one on the list, is rebellion. Somebody who is in rebellion is one who basically rejects, rejects the goals and the means and wants to replace them with their own idea of what society should be. And that is, that is explained in the chapter. Again, in, in edition three, it's on page 109. In edition two, it's like 10 to 20 pages earlier. So just look in, chap in, in the chapter on social structure and look for strain theory and, and you'll, find, you'll find that. Okay, and that's, let's go back on to where we were. Okay, let's see if this comes up properly. All right, so again, we were looking at the person climbing the ladder and strain would suggest that, you know, people try to climb the ladder and they divert because they can't, they can't get up the ladder. And they may be the innovators who find a different way of doing things. They may be the ritualists who just are climbing the ladder, or maybe they're not actually climbing the ladder, they're just going with the flow and they're doing their job, but they're not moving forward. The rebellionists, which are just throwing everything away, they might throw the ladder away and figure out another way to get what they want out of the world. But it doesn't have anything to do with society's goals or society's means, it has to do with whatever they dream up on their own so and of course your conformist is the person on the, the right side who's steadily going up the ladder getting to where where they need to go now does that mean that if you're a conformist that you're never going to have any problems no because if as a conformist you could say hey i know what the goals are i know what the means are you could still have you could still stumble along the way you could have a broken rung on your ladder but a conformist is going to recover from that broken lung, rung and get beyond it and keep going. Hopefully that's what you do in your studies and in your job and you know, raising your families or whatever. You, you have obstacles that get in the way. You figure out how to deal with those obstacles in the short term and move on. And I, I know from my past college that I worked at and here at Pierce, you know, things do happen in life. And it doesn't happen to be, always have to be the same uh, group of folks. I mean, it can happen to anybody, you know, where a family member dies, serious things happen, and you're set back. Your, your car's in a crash. I had somebody a few, a few uh, sessions ago whose car was in a crash, destroyed their car so they couldn't get to work. Their laptop was in the car. It was destroyed as well, so they couldn't do their school assignments. And they were set back for a week or two until they could get another computer or get transportation to the campus so they could do their thing. But they persisted and they got past it. And that's what conformists are gonna do. All right, so am I in my slideshow? Didn't move on to the next slide. Okay, relative deprivation. Interesting concept, relative deprivation. It's basically that people sense that there's, a, there's an inequality between what's going on up the block and what's going on in, in my house. 
could be social, could be economic. Again, the article on, on, on the, brew, the brewery town section of Philadelphia and the incident that went on there, this might be another really, really good example because you do have some economic inequality and even ide social ideas and, so and cultural ideas between the groups of people that are living in that neighborhood now that are, are different. So relative rep deprivation is somebody who, who looks and they see you know, people that are doing much better off, their houses are nicer, their cars are nicer, the stores they go to are nicer, whatever, and they're unable to get the same thing. They're unable to have the same stuff, but they see it. It's like right in front of their face because it's, it's right up the block. Or, you know, in brewery town, it's across the street maybe. Whereas, you know, if you come, if you're living in north of Philly, closer to Center City, you see all the high rises. Maybe you have a job down in Center City, uh, but your family's like really poor and not doing well and you live in a rundown, beat up house. But you, then you come down to Center City, you see all the high rises, you see the people out in the and they're really nice clothes, their suits, their outfits, what have you. And, you know, there's all kinds of nice things in certain areas. And you see that, and you see it on a daily basis. So the idea of relative deprivation suggests that these inconsistencies, these differences that people see right in front of their face, because they can't reach the dream, but they see other people who have, are why people commit crime. So the idea of relative deprivation is somebody sees that Joe Schmo from Idaho has it down the street and you know what, I can't get it, but I'm going to get it some other way. I'm going to take it. All right. And it's also the relation to the related to the notion of distributed justice where one might say, well, you know what, we to be fair, I should have the same thing that they're having. And then, you know, the rewards should be equal. Why, why should I live in squalor? or in this you know, terrible house, terrible neighborhood, whatever, while a guy down the street is, is driving a Jaguar and lives in a really, really nice brand new condo that was just built. You know, I want some of that. So distributive justice is the idea gets in somebody's head that if they can't, that if so-and-so has it, that they should get it too, and maybe they get it by means of crime. General strain theory is in 1992, Robert Agnew worked with some other folks and came up with some additional ideas for strain theory, a reformulation of strain theory, and basically suggested that law-breaking behavior was how people might cope. It was a coping mechanism to uh, deal with the socio-emotional problems that came out of their negative social relations. In other words, their, their negative stuff going on in their community. Uh, according to general strain theory, Strain occurs when you're either prevented or threatened. You know, somebody prevents or threatens to prevent you from getting your positively values goals, such as autonomy or financial success. So there's somebody standing in the way. Or somebody takes away something. Somebody removes or threatens to remove this positively valued stimuli. You know, maybe a romantic, you lose a romantic partner or the death of a loved one. This causes that strain and it's taken away from you. It's blocked and you're going to take some action to, to fix that. And you know, the, the examples that they use are very relevant to, say, cases of domestic violence. You have a case where, you know, somebody doesn't get along and usually it's the female trying to break away from the male and the male is not accepting of that and then they attack. And not that, not that that happens all the time, but since they use this example of the loss of a romantic partner, that strain sometimes causes people to act out in an inappropriate way. And another one, they present or threaten to present someone with noxious or negatively valued stimuli, such as for verbal insults or physical abuse. This also causes strain, which may cause somebody to act out in a negative way. So how does it expand on traditional strain theory? Man, remember traditional strain theory, we were talking about how people would, would react to society, whether it be the conformist, the innovator, the ritualist, the retreatist, or uh, the person in rebellion? Well, this general strain theory includes all types of negative relations between an individual and other people, and it maintains that strain is likely to have a cumulative effect on delinquency after reaching a certain threshold. In other words, what they're saying is if you have 
one bad thing happened to you and another bad thing happened to you and another bad thing happened to you. At some point, you're going to reach the breaking point and you're going to do something bad in this way. And I think one of the articles on, on the Brewery Town thing also talked a little bit about people reaching their breaking point. And uh, you hear that sometimes from criminal defense attorneys that, well, this thing happened and that thing happened and he just ba reached his, ba his breaking point. Nobody else, who else could stand that strain? That's what they're talking about, basically, is all these bad things happened and they had to, they, they lashed out in an inappropriate way. Uh, also provides a more comprehensive account of the cognitive, behavioral, and emotional adaptation to strain. All right, some negative effect states, there are adverse emotions that come from the experience of strain. And some of those might be anger, fear, depression, or disappointment. Now we talked uh, last week a little bit about road rage. So you have somebody who, who gets angry because of this constant strain. Maybe, the, maybe the, the cumulative effect of being blocked on a highway multiple times and can't get to where they're going. And maybe there's a potential that if they're, they're going to a job interview that they won't get the job. Or if they're late for the 19th day in a row that they're going to lose the job they already have, that causes anger in them and they act out. Uh, that was just another example or another explanation that might be for, for road rage. But you also can have fear, depression, and disappointment that comes out of those various strain situations. All right, that ends our section on strain theory. Okay, so we're gonna give this in, in doses that you can really digest. And what I would suggest is that you review the, the section on strain and general strain theory right after you're done with this particular segment. And then before you move on to our next video, which will be the fourth video in this series, look at the section on culture conflict theory and, and read that over before you, you watch the next video. Okay, so we'll see you soon. Remember the next video is on culture conflict theory. So read both review the section of chapter on strain theory, and then look at the section of the chapter on culture conflict theory before you come and join us for the next video. Take care.